my city council. He's one of my two city councilmen. That's when we really started doing some work together. He was very beneficial to me to doing some things. Um, my thought was uh, Baltimore, East Baltimore was so bad at the time. It had for almost 40 years straight been the number one violent district, the number one most impoverished. The only district that came close to it and beat it out one year was the Western District. We call them sister districts, the West Side and the East Side, but Eastern was always bad. And so by being a man of God, today I'm also an assistant pastor. At that time I was a minister when I started. Um, I asked God, how in the world can I do better than the 21 commanders that came before me? They all smarter than me. They knew the job better than I. They were all more good looking than well, another word. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I had to ask God, I need help. Because I think the one thing I have on all of them is I have a dynamic relationship with you. And if you would talk to me, and my wife and I prayed that night together on our bended knees in our home, if you would just give me two things, direction and a vision, we can do this. I'll just follow, no matter how out of the box it is. And so three days later, in the wee hours, I had to get up in like four or five hours. I don't know why God couldn't wait, but he woke me up in the middle of the night and downloaded that vision. It was people like Carl and other collaborators, community collaborators, because I knew this one thing that the police were not going to dig themselves out of their hole. The attitude, the way people didn't like us, um, the way my cops were cursing out the community, abusing the communities, this was going to be a God thing. And I'm sorry I'm being offensive, but this is the God's honest truth and this is who I am. And so we did that and I followed some things that God told me to do. They were so out of the box, I couldn't tell my superiors what I was doing because I thought they might lock me up and put me in a loony tomb. And so, but I did them anyway. I transformed my officers. I put my foot in there behind. Every time I caught them mis abusing the community, cursing out the community, um, um, slamming people down for no apparent reason. Long story short, with the help of Carl, some church leaders, community leaders, the teachers, just everything. Hopkins was thought about as being a thought to be that gorilla in the room. All they do is snatch us off the street, experiment. They don't do well by us. And I found out that in the nation, the zip code, this zip code in this area, we were the top 10 in the nation zip code in tuberculosis and AIDS at the time. And I thought that was incredibly astounding being that we have the number one medical institution in the world right now in our backyard. So we went in and we built some relationships and God just blessed. And so I'll just say this to you. I was there for four and a half years. I was being punished to stay there, stay there, stay there <laughs> because it's such a burnout district. They get you out in two or three years. But they kept me there, and I will tell you, by year one, we were at a tremendous crime low. By year two, we were at a 40-year low in crime across the board. And we kept that and continued to drop until finally I got promoted to lieutenant colonel in 2012. And then I took over because of then Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake. She says, what you did in East Baltimore, what you previously did in Northeast Baltimore, I need you to do it because I was doing community-oriented work. I need you to do it across the city. So she promoted me, but I didn't have the, I had the title, but I didn't have the authority. And so I was fighting on my own to do that, and finally we went through a couple of commissioners. Someone finally gave me, Commissioner Davis finally gave me some resources, and we finally started making inroads, and we started doing some great things across this city, building out networks, doing collaborative work. And I'll shut up with this, doing collaborative work with the state's attorney office. That wasn't being done before, right? They were always at each other, but we did collaborative work with the AUSA office, parole and probation, corrections across the state, because I knew my citizens were going to those jails, coming back better, better criminals. How can we get to them before they get back to the community and ravish us again? So we built behind the wall programs. We worked with athletes. Ray Law is one of my best friends, or at the time was a really good friend of mine, worked with me, boots on the ground with getting gang members out of gangs and getting them viable jobs. I'm probably past my time, so let me just say this. If it wasn't for the great people of the city, the good people of the city, when we had diversion programs and resources for our juveniles. I look at our juveniles across the city today and I cringe. But if we didn't do what we did, our juveniles were being transformed at a time because we worked with the school system. We actually, for the first time in decades, had police officers in a school every day teaching young people how to be better citizens through an explorers program. So I'll end with that. I did retire as a full colonel. <laughs> for the last three years of my career and for the last nine months, I was also wearing a hat of a deputy commissioner. So I was carrying two titles at the time I retired in June of 2019. And so I'm married to the beautiful Lolita, and I'm still an assistant pastor right here in Baltimore. I love Baltimore. I love you guys. Thank you for coming up. Wow.
don't need to apologize. You don't need to apologize. <laughs> the choir will sing. <laughs> well, thank you. And by the way, uh, Colonel, Deputy Com Chief, actually Deputy Commissioner, I left a couple of titles back there, but Deputy Commissioner actually had t two 20-year careers in the Baltimore Police Department. He retired after 20 years, missed us so much <laughs> that he came back and did another 20 years with us. And that's true. Uh, so we appreciate his dedication. He didn't do another 20 years uh, because he needed a bigger pension. He had quite a good pension, but he did miss the work that needed to be done. And he saw the work that needed to be done in our city. He couldn't leave it in the hands of others uh, who did not have the heart uh, for our citizens. And I know I'm editorializing, uh, but so what? Anyway, uh, Chief Robert McCall, he um, is a Baltimore City guy who uh, went out uh, and to Baltimore County, and I'll let him tell you about his career. And uh, Chief. Good morning. Thank you uh, to everyone who's here and took out the time to be with us this morning. Um, it's an honor to be here, uh, to be here with my esteemed colleagues to my left. Um, thank you for the invitation and inviting me here, being a uh, a Baltimore County Police Chief, uh, to be invited to Baltimore City uh, to speak is a big deal to me. Um, I'm a Baltimore City kid who grew up in the Western District and uh, went to City College, graduated from... So city? City, City forever. <laughs> what? No, I got my Hopkins, I got my, I got my Hopkins ring on today. Uh, any poly people, any poly people? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I still love it. We, we, we know who won in football. <laughs> I play basketball. That's so, <laughs> but um, but uh, went, went, went to City College, graduated in 1984, uh, joined the uh, Maryland National Guard with the basic training AIT, came back, and uh, my cousin, uh, who was a retired colonel from Baltimore County, Johnny Whitehead, at the time was a sergeant in, uh, in, in Baltimore County, and uh, he told me about the cadet program, and I was age 18 by then, because I was 17 when I joined the military, and I, I joined the cadet program. And uh, uh, there's some things that stick out in my head in my experience is that my, uh, my first week at work in Baltimore County at the time, um, one of the detectives that I worked with came up to me and asked me this question. He says to me, why did you come to Baltimore County? Why didn't you go to Baltimore City where you belong? Wow. I was 18 years of age. Wow. wow. That was said to me. Crazy. And, 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 and and early on, I learned that that was going to be a challenge. But I also remember something that Dr. Martin Luther King said. He said that no one has a right to reign on your dreams. And I was determined that no one would ever reign on my dreams. And uh, I, I went on to excel and actually became the first African-American cadet to make it to and through the academy alone. Nice. And, uh, and would later find out, 15 years later, from my squad sergeant, we were lieutenants together then. I was, a, I was a commander in internal affairs at the time. And he comes into my office one day and says to me, I have something to say to you, and it's always bothered me, but I need to tell you this. And I said, okay. And I knew he wasn't going to tell me something that I didn't know, but he comes in and tells me, he says, you do know you weren't supposed to make it through the academy. And keep in mind, I graduated second in my academy class, seven-tenths of a point from being first. Wow. Yeah. With no effort. Yeah. That was the environment. Yeah. I, you know, I learned early on that, that as an African-American in Baltimore County in 1985, okay, that they hired us with the intent to fire us. So I understood very early on the environment I was operating in but I also understood that I had the talent to rise above that. So I used that talent to, within two years after graduating from the academy, I became the first detective in the detective, African-American detective in the detective unit I was in. A few, four, a few more years from there, I would be, I would be promoted to, to corporal. And I, I learned, always learned very early on to learn to do the things that nobody else liked to do and that nobody knew how to do. 
So early on, I identified the fact that in our agency, we had something that was called an unusual occurrence, and it was basically those types of incidents that were unusual, but also most of these focused around officer-involved shootings and investigations. So I quickly became an expert at that, and I utilized that to write my career. So I quickly, the shooting team was outside of internal affairs, and it became such a prominent thing that they put it inside of internal affairs. So I ended up in internal affairs that I went from the rank of corporal to sergeant and lieutenant in internal affairs. But in between that, I always went back to patrol. Um, in between that, I developed an affinity for the community even more. When I was a sergeant, and I worked with retired captain, my chief of staff, Lamont Martin, there at the Woodlawn Precinct, where I was the community outreach sergeant. And uh, we went on to do wonderful things in the community, working with youth. Uh, we started a program under me there. Uh, it was called Joints, the Juvenile Offenders in Need of Supervision Program. It was a diversionary program, and it would go on. And it's existed for now for uh, some over 25 years or more, um, and well, close to 30 years, 28 years, I think it is now. But um, we would go on to win awards and, and do wonderful things in, in the lives of children, including um, young men and women who are actually uh, members of our agency now who were in that program. Uh, so, and, and, and moving on there, um, you know, I was a lieutenant in internal affairs, and uh, um, many of you probably remember when I was the public information officer. Um, I, I'll tell you the story behind that. Just know that that wasn't intentional either. So, um, but uh, I would go on, make captain, make major, uh, go on to be chief of detectives, chief of operations, uh, over a, a 35 year and eight month uh, career. Um, in year 34, I would apply to become the chief of police and uh, was a finalist in that process. And there were three people in, at the end of that process. And then there was somebody else added to the process and the story took care of itself. I always believe that God, uh, he does everything for a reason. And I, I, I went on, I had a, a, a wonderful career. I, I impacted uh, many people's lives. Um, I, I think uh, one of the, uh, the greatest things, uh, at least one of the things that warms my heart most is when I look around and I see all the young people in my agency that I either mentored um, or impacted their lives as children or they became police officers because of their direct contact with me in their daily lives. They're everywhere, and uh, that, that, that's the most important thing to me. Um, I retired uh, for 20, for 28 months I was retired, and uh, had the opportunity to come back as the, the chief of police. I always believe God does everything for a reason, and, and in my situation, I truly believe he, he did it so that he could get the glory, Amen. not that I would get the glory. Um, I think that the people of the organization knew my heart, they knew my work ethic. Um, I always, and throughout my entire life, um, believed and treated people with dignity and respect. I always believe in being a gentleman, but also believe in being a professional, but I don't hesitate to do my job as a law enforcement professional either. Um, I was at a community meeting uh, just this past week, and there was a young man there in the meeting, and uh, I've known him for years, and he stood the meeting, he was speaking, and we were talking about when I was a patrol officer, and we talked about that, and I told him, I said, um, I told him, I said, we talked about me locking people up, and he, he said, yeah, you locked me up. I said, I locked you up, but I was always fair, right? And he said, you were always fair. And that was the most important thing. We, we have to do our jobs, but we have to be professional, but we also have to be fair and treat everyone with dignity and respect. Because at the end of the day, no matter who people are, you know, the, the one shred of, 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 of our humanity, of who we are, is our, is our dignity. And I don't, you know, I don't care whether you go down to northern Pennsylvania or whether you go to Towson. People will fight you for their dignity. You can't take that away from somebody. You have to allow people to have their dignity. And we have to continue to do that. So I lead with the mantra of 
treating people with dignity and respect. I talk to my people about making sure that dignity and respect exist amongst us as professionals, as law enforcement professionals, that we treat each other with dignity and respect. So that if we treat each other with dignity and respect, we'll go out in the community and treat the community with dignity and respect. Um, so once again, I'm, I'm glad to be back. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of the pendulum swinging back the other way because we were so focused on it going the other way to the point that everybody, including law enforcement, everybody's jumping off the ship. And our society was, I, I don't even know where we were going. Um, but I'm proud to say that um, with my colleagues here and with our, our fine state's attorney, and with our Baltimore County state's attorney, uh, Scott Schellenberger, we were working hard to, uh, to make the Baltimore metropolitan area a safe place to live, work, play, and, and, and to be a, a, a place where we can be proud to live and pay our taxes. So, thank you for having me. Thank you, Chief. And uh, there uh, will be um, later, uh, because of our friend and uh, expertise, there will be uh, this uh, presentation will be uh, online and uh, folks can go see it. There are many people who are waiting to look at it uh, online, and we will make sure that it goes out. This is already a very inspirational place. You know, many times people uh, on the right politically uh, say, lock them up, throw away the key. Uh, conversely, many times people on the far left say, don't lock anybody up um, and let them go. Uh, I think for the uh, first time, and one of the few times in America, not just here in Baltimore, uh, we have a state's attorney, sometimes called a DA in some other places, who has combined justice with compassion and who makes uh, justice uh, the word truly just. And uh, we thank him for the efforts he is making now and I'm certain will continue to make. Uh, state's attorney, Ivan Bates. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, good to see you, uh, Carl, as I said, my councilman. Uh, Mr. Jennings, good to see you, thank you for having me. Panelists, some of the, the greatest minds in law enforcement that you know I've had the opportunity to know and to meet and speak to before I was the state's attorney and even get to know even better since I've been the state's attorney. It's an honor to share, share this opportunity to speak. And thank you, everybody, for coming out. You know, um, <clears throat> it's, fun, it's interesting because, you know, I always sit down and think about, you know, Black History, Black History Month, what it means and things like that. I think when I look at myself and my journey, I'm one of these, I've just always kept my head down. I'm just moving, moving, moving and not necessarily taking the time to look to see what, if anything, I have accomplished. But I do think as we tend to get a little bit older, especially, you know, I have a seven-year-old daughter, you kind of look at things in life a little bit differently. Um, you know, I think about who I was, where I came from, and all of those things. And, you know, they always will tell you, you shouldn't be here. And, you know, I remember, you know, my parents were in the military, lived everywhere. And I remember the first time I really wanted to ever be a lawyer was in eighth grade. I took a test, and I said I wanted to be a lawyer. The test came back and said, you don't have the aptitude. You need to lay, become a brick mason. And that really affected me in a way that nothing ever had because I barely graduated from high school after that. I just didn't care. Um, but my mother and father, they were very strict parents. They told me I need to leave their house because it was time they'd done their job. So I joined the Army. And in the United States Army, it really gave me a purpose. My father was military, so I grew up in a pretty strict household. Um, but I think a part of me always thought he was going to take care of me my whole life. Um, <laughs> But when I did graduate, he let me know. I'll never forget the day I graduated. Congratulations. This is a great job. This is the job you've done. Now you got to get out of my house. <laughs> but this is my house, Dad. No, this ain't your house. You're going to pay no mortgage here. Your mom and I are about to live our life. And so, you know, with that, that's, you know, the main reason I joined the Army. It was very hard, but it was the best decision. It gave me the focus of leadership, teamwork, dedication. I learned a lot. I learned I didn't like digging ditches and taking orders and just being in the middle of nowhere. And I learned, and I'll never forget, I'll never forget, we had a, a sergeant major who was a Vietnam veteran. And to me, he was the person we went to war I was going to stand next to because he knew he was going to save my life. 
And I said, well, why are you not the one giving orders? And why is the young guy who's the lieutenant, why is he telling us what to do? Because he clearly don't know how to read this map, but we're going to die in college. <laughs> and he said, well, he went to college, and I didn't. I said, so what are you saying? He said, well, you go to college, you get to be the boss. I said, so if I go to college, I don't have to listen to him? He said, sure. So after that, I think the, the rest is history. You know, I, I applied. I went to Howard University. Uh, and then I really learned to apply myself. You know, and even at Howard University, you know, I, once again, you know, I'm kind of one of these, my, my, my dad and I talked years later, I got the force gump of life in a lot of ways. You know, I wasn't really focused on books. But, you know, I was in the military. I was like, oh, look at all these beautiful women. They're in the library. I need to go to the library to be near them. And so I, I started dating a young lady, showed me how to study, what I needed to do. And remember, I already had the discipline. And then I realized what I needed to do. Little by little, I began to uh, become a, a better student, graduated from Howard University of Honors, went to William & Mary to law school. It was a great experience in law school. Um, but I also went through some things because of William & Mary as a class, I think 18, 1900 people applied. It's a class of 120. And, you know, I also, you know, dealt with some things with the racism in the South. Even though I'd grown up in Hampton with my father, we were in Williamsburg. And out of a class, I think it was about 120 or 118, I think 18 are, were going to be African American or minorities. And so that was an interesting experience. And two things really kind of defined me. One, um, I'll never forget, I went to the Gloucester County State's Attorney's Office. And I went out there to work because I, you know, I was trying to figure out what being a prosecutor was like. And I went to, this, to, the, the, to the Commonwealth's Attorney, they weren't called the State's Attorney, Commonwealth Attorney. And he asked me, why was I here? I said, why am I law? I'm the intern. And he looked at me and he said, when they start letting coloreds into my university, mm -hmm. my school. And this was in 90, 1990, I think. Yeah, I graduated from law school, not in 94, I graduated from law school in 95. And I said, well, you do know the civil rights and all this <laughs> happened. And he says, yeah, but I thought, you know, William and Mary didn't, you know, law school didn't let colors in. So this is what we're going to do. You'll never need to come back here. You want credit. I said, I need credit because this is a stipend. He gave me three jobs. Three, three things to research. I did the research and I mailed them all. We didn't have the internet then. I mailed all three to him. I never heard from him again, but I did have the money for the stipend so I could continue my education. I eventually went and worked in the NAACP Legal Defense Fund out in Los Angeles, and that was a great opportunity where I got to really look at things differently. We dealt with an issue involving how the police were disproportionately releasing dogs on African Americans and Latinos. They released 100 canines, and there were 99 dog bites. We filed our lawsuit. It went from 100 down to 10. That pretty much proved the case for us. I was out in California when the O.J. Simpson situation happened, and so I got to understand criminal law and everything. And so one thing led to another. I wanted to go back to California and work in the NAACP Legal Defense Fund because that's what I wanted. But my mother said, you know, I need you to go to Baltimore. I said, Baltimore, why? She says, your aunt. She's had an aunt of 75 years of old age, lived up the street, left West 20th Street, apartment 6S. She didn't have any children. She said, my sister's older and she needs help. So I said, okay. I applied to clerk for Judge David Mitchell. He was here in Baltimore City. He hired me. And, um, you know, I clerked for him for a year. It was a great experience. Learned a lot. He did juvenile. So I saw a lot with the juvenile system. And then it was time to get a job. I was like, well, I want to go be a public defender. I want to defend people. He says, okay, public defenders didn't want me, but the state's attorneys wanted me, Mrs. Jessamy, Pat Jessamy. Uh -huh. So I met Mrs. Sharon May, I met Haven Kodak, I met Miss, met Miss Jessamy. I was like, oh, you sound, you make me seem like you're my aunt from the South. <laughs> you know, um, and so she blessed me, she hired me. I was in district court. One of the first places I was was Southwest District. So I didn't really feel like I could prosecute people if I didn't know who the people were. So I volunteered to be a basketball coach at Rockland Heights Middle School. It was a great experience because I got to see the kids. I got to understand the community. I need to understand the community because once again, I wasn't from Baltimore. I thought it was a disservice being from the world, so to speak. I lived in Germany. I lived in New Mexico, Texas, was born, you know, Virginia. But I had never spent time in Baltimore. Went to school in D.C. That was a great opportunity because I got to understand the kids and what was going on. And so, you know, I really enjoy being a young prosecutor in district court, working my way up through circuit court. And 
eventually I made, did a homicide, and I had student loans. So I left and worked for a big firm, Shulman Tree and Chemical Guild and Ravenel. And I learned a lot working with them. I worked with them for about six years. We had a case point before the U.S. Supreme Court. It was a phenomenal experience. And then I started my own practice. I did my own practice from no clients to eventually people say I was one of the top criminal defense attorneys in the city, in the state. I did cases all around the country. And I would say I did two big cases. Well, I did a number of, well, three big cases. Felicia Barnes, I represented the gentleman in charge of that. Um, I was the one that, after they found him guilty, I made the argument and got the case thrown out. I represented Sergeant Leisha White in the Freddie Gray matter, the African-American sergeant. That was an excellent experience because it was so difficult to go against your community and all that you knew the police had done, but I needed to stand up for this woman because I did not see a police officer. I saw a black woman, and I saw a criminal justice system, to me, that was going to treat her unfair because not the color of her skin, but because of the uniform she had on, it wasn't going to look at all the evidence. And so it was very difficult. It was very difficult for me emotionally, mentally. Um, I had my friends, I went to Howard, called me Uncle Tom, sell out everything you could imagine because I represented a police officer. But to me, that was the experience in life that said, when you believe in something, you need to stand up for it. And I was very glad and thankful to have that experience. And to this day, Sergeant White is now, I think, Captain Alicia White in the Baltimore City Police Department. And you know, look, people have different views about what happened one way or another. I get it, I understand it, I'm never here to change your views, but I know that that's something that I needed to do in my life, and I'm really <coughs> glad that I'm proud that I did that. Um, but I also learned so much about the police department and police procedures that I saw, as I was representing Alicia, I saw what Wayne Jenkins was doing in the Gun Trace Task Force. So what people didn't realize, my experience <coughs> with Sergeant White and police understanding police tactics, police procedures, it allowed me to do what I needed to do to try to focus on Wayne Jenkins. So the same day I was getting cursed out and called Uncle Tom walking to court representing Alicia, at the end of the day I was going to the jail finding people that Wayne Jenkins and that, that gas, gun trace task force had jacked up. I took that information and I represented this one guy and he was a big drug dealer. But we won that case and I was able to show what had happened. He's the one that they stole about a hundred and some odd thousand in the safe. He's the one that cracked that case open. Once I won that case, I told my client, the feds are coming. They're going to either make you a witness or they're coming at you because you violated the law. No doubt you violated the law, but the police violated your rights. They stole from you. When the police re reach out to you, you call me. Feds reached out to him a few months later. He called me. I was able to get him and his wife to go before the uh, grand jury. I was able to get some of my other clients to go before the grand jury because what I learned as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, I began to put a case together against Wayne Jenkins and the Corrupt Gun Trace Task Force officers. In doing that, I recognized that they had a motive, that, that while they were robbing people, what they were doing was wrong. I gave that information to the U.S. Attorney's Office. The U.S. Attorney's Office used that to convict Wayne Jenkins and a number of other members of the Gun Trace Task Force. I think I had seven or eight members, client, former clients, that went through in front of the grand jury. A number of them testified in the trials. And from there, they were found guilty. Well, I ran for state's attorney. First time, as you know, I lost. And so that was a great experience for me as well because sometime before you win, you got to know how to lose. It needed, I needed to understand and humble myself. And to be honest, I was not emotionally prepared to be the state's attorney for Baltimore City. Um, but I also had unfinished business to do with my cases, unfinished business to do with the Gun Trace Task Force. They wrote a book about, uh, called I Got a Monster. I was the main character. They've done documentaries, movies, and all of that. That was phenomenal. But then I now moved. I ran an election, three-person election. When many people said I wasn't going to win because I was against a highly favored incumbent. And once again, I felt God opened the door at the right time, the right place. I had the right message. Having been a criminal defense attorney and a prosecutor, I recognized that you have to hold people accountable. People expect to be held accountable, but if you don't, whether it's the police, whether it's the criminal element, then you're going to lose your credibility. And so my next time I ran, I really ran on how I really felt. And, you know, I do believe in sending you to jail if you earned that right to go to jail and you've done something of a heinous crime. But I also am really big on second chances. I believe we can rehabilitate individuals. I believe in the wraparound services for our young people, but I also believe in holding young people accountable at the very beginning. 
you're talking to a young man whose father did not play. And to this day, I'm still scared at me. <laughs> but, you know, for me, it was a great opportunity um, to be your state's attorney. But the reason I say I wasn't mature is because, I'll be honest, when you become state's attorney in Baltimore City, you get a lot of notoriety. And if you aren't grounded in who you are already, you can go to your head. This is a position I said I run twice, so maybe six, maybe eight years. And then you could potentially move on to something else. I miss being a regular citizen, to be honest. I've realized that. I mean, you probably saw I have my executive protection there with you. I'm single. You should imagine trying to date with executive protection. It's the easiest thing to do. But what you also have to understand is I understand how important this job is to work and to keep the citizens of Baltimore City safe working to change the narrative of our city that we truly do love. But I recognize I'm here for a moment to do the best job possible, and then I move on. Ivan Bates is not going to be the state's attorney for life. I am here as a luxury to do the job that you, the citizens, want me to do and help keeping you safe. But I also realize that I can't do this job by myself. One of the things I first did was reach out to the police department to reestablish relationships and to, to, to just go to the community to say, hey, what can we do? What are the things you care about? And what are the things that we need to do to make Baltimore safer? And so we worked very hard to reestablish and rebuild the office, the state's attorney's office. I got there. There were 134 attorneys. Since I've been there, I think the exact numbers we figured out, we've hired 86 new state's attorneys. And so some have left, some have come, but now I think we have about 170 some total in the office. We're rebuilding it, we're training. You know, we, we were gonna be able, the governor just gave us a grant of 1.7 million to help with body camera. We have training. We're doing the things that we really need to do to build the infrastructure, not just for today, but for tomorrow, and eventually when I do leave this position, so that office can be a good, healthy office because that, to me, is what's going to be important. Making sure we've developed an office to making sure that we have a mindset to hold people accountable, but to do it in a way that's fair, that is just, but to also give people a second chance when they've shown that they've worked hard to earn those second chances. So I'm very glad to be here, and I'm very blessed and honored to be your state's attorney. Uh -huh. Thank you, sir. And um, State's Attorney uh, Bates has led us into the next part of the conversation uh, by talking about collaboration. I know that for many, many, many years, uh, particularly in Baltimore City, um, that there was not collaboration. As a matter of fact, there was the opposite of collaboration uh, between our police and our uh, State's Attorney. Uh, I would like the officers, uh, particularly uh, law enforcement officials, uh, since uh, Ivan has uh, given a little bit from his side uh, just in the last couple of minutes, uh, to talk, if you would, uh, Chief and Deputy Commissioner, uh, about what that collaboration uh, should look like uh, in terms of law and order. I can start um, in, in terms of that collaboration. I'd like to... Uh actually use Baltimore County as an example. Um, we were one of the first uh, community policing organizations in the nation, first three agencies in the country uh, back in 1979 and 1980 to implement community policing. Um, since then, we've built an elaborate um, structure in our organization where we have police community relations councils across all 10 precincts uh, at, at Baltimore County, the whole 612 square miles. We also um, in addition, that have community outreach units in, in those precincts, and we also have uh, a police foundation, and we have, um, I don't know, it's probably in excess of 270 community associations um, in Baltimore County. Um, that, with that said, um, as a police organization, in terms of cooperation and connection to the community, we have that connection. We, we, we communicate, we have everything from email chains to, to social media networks set up. So there's always that ongoing communication, that interaction, and that interaction goes on from the chief of police down through the organization all the way down to the police officer. 
Um, in, in terms of that collaboration, um, you know, we collaborate with our community, but we also collaborate with our state's attorney, um, with our other surrounding jurisdictions. As you know, um, there's also task force that we all belong to. So we, we have the Regional Auto Theft Task Force, and we deal with the, the issue of auto theft and carjackings and stuff, stuff like that. But we also have WATF, the Warrant Task Force. So we have long-standing cooperative agreements, MOUs, and everything in the area for those types of units. But there's also that collaboration between the, the state and local law enforcement with our federal partners in, the agency, in, in, a, in, in this area that we also belong to those task forces and that we work together. So I'll let you know, go and pick up from there. Well, listen, I'll just ditto what Chief McCullough just said. So let me, let me just say this. For me, um, a light bulb went off, I think it was 2009, when I was the major over here, and I had three gang members come to my district, and they were sitting right outside my detective's unit, and I thought there were maybe witnesses um, to a shooting or something. And as I was walking out of the building, I walked past them, they said, sir, can we see you? And I said, well, they'll be right with you. I was on my way to a community meeting. And um, they said, no, we're, we're here to see you. We're not here to see you. So long story short, <clears throat> I sat down with them, and so here's what I recognized. Um, you got to learn the pulse of your people in the community. Mm -hmm. And you got to learn to listen. And so I heard what they were saying, and basically they said, listen, we have ruined our lives. These were, these were three gang members tatted up. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't speak to the gangs they were involved in. Um, but they were tatted up and said, but we're so tired at this point. We don't want to be doing what we're doing, but there is nothing else to do to survive. And so we need your help. We need jobs. And we need homes because we're surfing couches, yada, yada, yada. And I was so impacted by that. And what got me, they said, if you help us, because here's the thing, and I was a major at the time, Major Russell, we know about you through our fathers and our grandfathers. So I really felt old when they started saying that. <laughs> but, but, but they said, they said, you have arrested a lot of people. But as Chief said earlier, you've always been fair. You've always did it with dignity and respect. So here's what we're saying to you. If you can help us fulfill those two things, then we can help you reduce the crime across this city dramatically. And that caught my attention. So I don't know if you remember this call. I called Carl because they proposed, let us prove it to you. And I'm going somewhere with this. Let us pull the worst gang members, organizations, across to be in one green space and let us just fellowship for a couple hours and we promise you there won't be one incident. I said, you're talking about where you guys come together and literally go out hunting for each other. These type of people? And I started like, eh, I promise you. We'll call a truce. So I bent the rules a little bit. I need to find green space. And if you know anything about East Baltimore, there's not a lot of green space. <laughs> and so, so I bent the rules a little bit because they once said, listen, we got to smoke marijuana. That's what we do. And I'm like, oh, no, I can't approve that. <laughs> and, but I'm not going to tell you what I did because you'll probably look at me like I got three heads. They said, we got to drink. No, you're not going to drink. I bent the rules a little bit. But I called Carl, and I don't know if you remember this, Drew for Blue, Jack. <laughs> When he was running that school, they had a large, and it's still that large green space out back. And I begged him, I said, oh, can I please, I don't think I even told you the full story why I wanted it, but I said, can I please have that? He said, yes, you can have it. And so we allowed them to go there from like 4 p.m. until midnight. Now, I was personally doing a date out of town. We were in Myrtle Beach, baby, I don't know if you remember. And I got a phone call, and, and I got a phone call from one of the residents and said, how dare you major? The park was a mess, all that racket all night long, yada, yada, yada. And I said, oh, my God, because I told him, I said, you got to police the area, you got to call one of them. They said, what? No. Who told you that? Huh. It's clean. So I called the person back. I said, when did you see it? I just know. I heard all that noise all night long, that music, boom, 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 boom. I said, can you go to your front door, because I knew where she lived, look out. And, oh, my God, the park's never been so clean. <laughs> and then for the next three days, they called the truce on crime across the city. There wasn't one homicide, one shooting, one act of violence throughout the whole city. I called them three days later, and if you know Baltimore, that's impossible. <laughs> and I called them three, they called me three days later, we're just checking in, Major, anything happened. I said, I'm astound, nothing. We told you. We all went on hold, now we gotta get back to surviving. So we need you to go to work for us. And I was like, wow. So I spent the next six years of my life, here's the collaboration part. I said they need jobs. How do you get felons job? So I started talking to the medical institutions, John Hopkins, every hospital across the country, with met um, across the country, across this city, the universities, the Eds, the Meds, the hospitality, Under Armour, any industry that can employ people. 
And I had Ray Lewis with me, and I, I, and I could talk freely now, but I used to tell them, the President of Hopkins, who was a really good friend of mine, the President of Hopkins University, Daniel and, and Ron, and I said, listen, you can't tell my commission. I'll get in trouble. You can't tell the mayor. I'm not sure how they'll take this. But I need you to hire these individuals. We'll clean them up for you, but then you got to hire them. So they did that, and we started hiring them at a rapid rate after we put them through a process <coughs> and cleaned them up, job preparation. But then we started going to judges. Now, you know judges, is, they got their own mindset. They don't answer to nobody. I'm sorry, right? But we said, judges, we need you. We're locking them up, and you're letting them go. State's attorneys, we need you. ASA, we need you. Parole, probation. We can't do this by ourselves, so we built out a collaborative table full of all these people, even youth were at the table, to say, how do we take our citizens and restore them? Because it's going to take all of our effort. And so I can't go into everything we've done, but courts were holding diversion <coughs> programs. Courts like Judge Wanda Hurd, a mentor of mine. Courts like Catherine, um, Karen Freeman. They were all on board, and we were doing these incredible things. The commissioner of all the jails across the country, Pete France at the time, he said, come in. And we took in resources, and we were training them, and we were giving them people skills, and yada, yada, yada. Churches were being mentored to them. It was a collaboration across the board. Even down to the nonprofits, drug rehabilitation. If you think of it, they were at the table. We had weekly meetings and saying we will rebuild Baltimore and we will do it one person at a time. I love what you said earlier about the things you built out and it's still going on now 28 years later. Unfortunately, Baltimore, they call it a crab city for a reason. If your fingerprint's not on it, if you're not an innovator of it, and I'm being brutally honest, when new administration get in, that's not ours. I don't care how well it was going. Push it to the side. I will tell you, as soon as I retire, every initiative we built out with all those wonderful collaborators across the city, I, my phone started ringing by the people that I left behind. They're getting rid of it. They're getting rid of it. Why? Because they didn't do it. And so all of a sudden, I started seeing violence tick back up in Baltimore City. And to this day, this year will be four years I'll be retired. Five years come June. And I don't like what I'm seeing. Because the collaboration isn't the way it used to be. Like he, I love what Baltimore County's doing. They're still on track. And when somebody leaves with a legacy, Baltimore County is smart enough to say, that works. We're keeping it. And the citizens of Baltimore County says, you're not getting rid of that. Baltimore City needs to learn a lesson from Baltimore County and say, we're not getting rid of that. That collaboration worked. And unfortunately, we keep going back to square one because of a new administration. And one of the things I like about Ivan, he didn't throw every, the baby out with the bathwater when he came in. He just took the broken pieces, got rid of them, kept the pieces that were working, and continued to build it up. That's where government really works, and that's what collaboration is really about. It ain't about any one of us. It's about all of us, and it's most important, it's about those that we serve, and how do we make their lives better. Because you make their lives better, you make the city greater. That's all I have to say. Great. Anything you wanted to add, Ivan, to what the, your two brother brothers have said? No, just that when I was talking about the maturity level, and that's something I think when you look at what's going on with the maturity level, you have to understand it's not a me, it is a we. You know, as we've been very blessed in my first year, yeah, murders are down 20%. And so the media wants to have you get into the war like, oh, this is me, this is me, this is me. It wasn't me, it was we. You know, the U.S. Attorney going, rebuilding. You know, I went to uh, roll calls to see the police just to say, hey, we're on in this together. You know, whether it's the Haida, going over there, being participating with Haida, going and talking to, to the kids, the schools, the outreach. You know, we don't talk enough about the programs that are out there, such as ROCA, that are giving deterrence other people opportunities that they don't have before. So if we don't all put our egos at the door and say, hey, this is the people's position, I'm here for a moment, I'm here to build upon, then I think that's exactly what Melvin was talking about. When, you know, you have to build upon what's working, and then when you've had your time, move on, prepare the next group, right. then they move on and build and you prepare. So that's the process of doing it, and that's why I think, you know, when you sit back and you look at how you were successful, and, you know, even with, within the criminal element, you have to be able to sit down and have those conversations to say, okay, I hear you, I understand, 
I think having been a criminal defense attorney, I kind of look at it and I get it in a different mm -hmm. light than I think some other people have. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that just because you've been part of the criminal element, you want to live that life. That's right. But how can we make those changes? Because there are kids in those neighborhoods that look up to the individuals in those gangs that that's who they want to emulate. We don't want that. We know that's not for them, but how can we break that cycle in a way so that this young person doesn't get in before you know it? And as I tell them, I'd rather deal with you in the juvenile system with wraparound services than dealing with you as a 15, 16 year old that's pulled the trigger and killed somebody. Now you're in an adult system. So how do we do that, Mr. Clavery? Uh, thank you. <laughs>